I'm Dave Baker. And I'm Spandrew Spice. Welcome to Deep Cuts, the podcast where we pick a topic and walk you through the ins, the outs, and the nitty gritty so you can appear like an interesting and idiosyncratic person at your next forced social function. Today's topic is... Catherine Leroy. Who was Catherine Leroy? Well, she's one of the most celebrated and daring war photographers in the history of the medium. Her photos changed the way Americans saw the Vietnam War, interfaced with the concept of war, and permanently altered the way the media covered conflicts globally. One, the most badass human ever. Catherine Leroy, born August 27th, 1944, was a French-born photojournalist and war photographer. She was most widely recognized for her work during the Vietnam War, which was published in the pages of Life magazine. Spandrew, uh, we got some photos here of Catherine Leroy, uh, one of which she's got a camera. She got two cameras around her neck and she's wearing fatigues and a parachuting apparatus. Uh, the other where she's standing in a group of GIs during Vietnam, changing the film, it looks like, or adjusting the shutter or something on her camera. Uh, And she is also wearing fatigues. And she's in both photos. She's got uh, blonde pigtails and a kind of 60s hair band thing going on. How would you describe what Catherine Leroy looks like? Catherine Leroy, I can't say, for some reason, Catherine and Leroy together, I can't say. Catherine Leroy looks like a badass. <laughs> uh, yeah, she looks. She's she's a very unique looking silhouette. She's got uh, this sort of like I don't know. It's black and white, so I can't tell. But I think she's like a blonde woman, or maybe just like a dirty blonde. She's got. She seems to wear this like signature like white uh, headband thing, like a stretchy thing that goes around your head to like keep your hair out of your face and then contrasted the sort of the sort of like light colored hair and this white headband thing that she's wearing contrasted with her uh sort of camouflage army fatigues or or you know army jacket and pants and wearing uh a a bunch of bags and and packs and then she's like got like three cameras strapped around her neck it's a very, very, very unique looking situation we got here. It's funny, too, because in the first photo, she kind of has this like almost snarl on her face. Like, get this fucking camera out of my face. <laughs> like, what the fuck is this? Uh, Catherine Leroy looks like the girl that you would ask to uh, the like junior prom dance. But she looks like the, the type of girl that she would tell you that she hasn't like, oh, I'm I'm doing something that day. And then you like see her on the fucking news. You know what I mean? Like... <laughs> She's the she's like the fucking person like holding the camera or whatever. Uh, you're like, oh, she really did have something to do that day. <laughs> Catherine Leroy looks like if you plugged in a prompt in Mid Journey and said, "Show me what Spinelli from Recess looked like in 20 years." Uh, Catherine Leroy looks like uh the interstate Des Moines, Iowa women's speed swimming championship winner. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting too though how you can just kind of tell stuff about somebody just even by like the way that they carry themselves and their kind of their countenance. Like in both of these photos she's like next to these big GI dudes who are like, you know, six, two, six, three, and she's probably about five, three, five, four. And yet she just has this air of kind of like, come at me, bro. You know, she's got this big, like, I know what I'm doing energy. Well, and that's interesting to say, because I mean, we'll get into this a little bit in the episode, but um, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot to be said about the humanization of people that you are not that you don't know and that you are not in the same vicinity of utilizing media and the way that act of globalized humanization has slowly 
ha- has slowly been like brought to the world via first paintings and then photography and then, you know, moving pictures and the way that like certain people have sort of pioneered that, which is what we're talking about now. Uh, this idea, like, you know, famously the way that um, Jackie O brought cameras into the White House and like for the first time ever, there was like televised, you know, video of daily life inside of the White House and the way that that was able to humanize the president and like humanize the act of governance uh, and ostensibly supposedly bring a greater transparency to the way that the country was governed, though that, you know, ended up not really happening or I don't think people feel that that's the way that it is. Um, but I think that also, but like what you're saying of like the trans, it the feeling of transparency is almost more important than the actual transparency because you know the idea of Camelot of the the 60s kind of visual revolution of the presidency. I mean, I think that's directly correspondent to what happens in Vietnam, where it's that same logic gets applied to the horrors of war. You know, it's almost like the camera being integrated into the. Um, political process you know they always say that kennedy was the first television presidency and you know vietnam was the first television war and that doesn't happen without people on the ground wandering around with cameras filming these atrocities that really opens up the public's view of what these situations what the toll of these situations but the thing that we're going to be talking about a lot is like the toll on the people holding the cameras is almost proportionate to the amount of awareness of people in positions of safety. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, this is kind of the point of this episode. So it's not like, you know, we'll get to this. We don't want to spend it all up front. But I think that the, uh, you know, the idea of bringing it similar to similar to bringing cameras into the White House, bringing TV cameras into the White House, bringing cameras, you know, into the front lines of the Vietnam War was this way of basically allowing people to see that this isn't just something happening vaguely somewhere else that you can kind of like put out of your mind, like somewhere else, there's some people that are just fighting this war and it's like good and, and they're just doing it. And they're these like soldiers. And I don't like, I don't really think about them as people or humans. I just think about them as soldiers that are doing this thing. And then the way that you can immediately break that illusion by just showing people pictures of like, these are those people you're talking about. They're here. They're actually going through these things. And it's weird how human beings are are strangely not equipped to understand that unless they're directly shown. Like we're really bad at, at like imagining humanity unless it's put right into our face, which I think is a is a factor of the I, I think that's a a byproduct of the fact that we're really not meant to like be connected in this way. Like we're supposed to just kind of be like in villages and like only the people in our like surrounding mile radius are relevant to us. Outside of that is the out group. There's just a vague enemy. And as long as they leave us alone, we're good. And if anybody comes in, we just have to like kill them and kind of our interaction with the outside world and the increased globalization and also sort of like the dismantling of the uh the village dynamic over the like globally connected dynamic uh even before the internet existed just this idea that we are like a big like a, 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 a this entire country this entire nation uh you know 3000 miles away and thinking of them as a human being people like this were able to go in and like bring that empathy into our homes essentially through photographs raised a devout catholic leroy took parachuting lessons as a child earning her license at age 18 she eventually decided to travel to south vietnam at the age of 21 to document what was happening with the war she booked a one way ticket to laos in 1966 with $200 in her pocket and a leica m2 camera upon eventually arriving in saigon in 66 she met photographer Horst Fast, the bureau chief of the Associated Press. A year later, she was the first credited journalist to participate in combat parachuting on February 23rd, 1967. So that's fucking nuts, too, is that it's nuts that you would be like, oh, OK, I'm just going to go halfway across the world, take photos of this crazy situation. And then, you know what? That's that's too uh, that's too safe. You know what the people really need? People really need to experience on a photography level, what it's like to jump out of a plane into active combat. Like that just shows you the kind of like almost performance artist brain that she has, which is like the that's the reason why her photos had the impact that they did, because she almost thinks of things from this. How do you how are you going to jar people awake? You know? Yeah. And that's and that's yeah, that's and that's interesting that like, yeah, yeah, it's performance art in a way, but also 
it's like it's it's just it's fascinating the way that people certain people who just find in certain moments in in human history they find themselves as like the conduit for a very important cultural shift and they almost become like a sacrificial lamb to that effort like you know this person could have died horribly and got you know getting shot in crossfire or fucking died jumping out of this plane on with this parachute or whatever but just found it that they needed to be the person to sort of shepherd in this cultural shift in this way and be that person that was able to bring uh empathy to the west during the vietnam during the vietnam war and to just be like yeah like i i need to do this and if i die i die is just is a really like in a way yeah in a way it's fa- it's performance art and in a way it's just like it's a level of prescience and courage that i just can't even really fathom having yeah yeah because it, it really is like i believe in this thing this kind of standard of artistic expression and dissemination of knowledge so vehemently that i will literally go into a war zone armed with nothing more than a camera like she's in active combat like she's parachuting behind enemy lines there's no difference between her and and the GIs that are there armed to the teeth. Yeah, and, th- and there's even at least a an established, like, kind of neutral rule about, like, not hurting journalists on the battlefield that everybody, like, loosely follows. Although I think some journalists were killed recently in Ukraine by Russian forces, and that was a big controversy. Um, but I don't think that even existed now at this point. And also, even if it did, you're not going to you're you can't tell the difference. You know, they're just like in the jungle. If you see a bunch of people walking around with machine guns in American fatigues and you're a Viet Cong soldier, like you're not going to fucking. Oh, wait, uh, it looks like that one is like a foot shorter and a blonde haired photo. Oh, she's got a French accent. Okay, let's shoot everyone in that cluster except the person holding the camp. Like they're not doing that. They're like, fuck these guys. This is a war. Aim for the headband. <laughs> it, it'll serve as our North Star. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like that's it's just not happening. Like that's not a that's not a real thing in, in this specific context. You know, it's the same thing of like, you know, there's photojournalists and journalists who died during the Afghanistan and Iraq wars. Um, just because, you know, you're riding around with U.S. troops and a fucking like, you know, dirty bomb or a you know, a landmine goes off. Like, it's not like those people, you know, that it's not like those people were actively trying to kill the journalist. They were trying to <laughs> stop this invading force. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, of course, you're the, there's a huge risk in doing this and you might be the casualty of unavoidable uh, crossfire or just somebody not knowing you're somewhere. But at least, like, you know that there's nobody that's going to purposely try to kill you. Like, that. Like they, they at least are like, you know, if if you if you turned the wrong corner and came face to face with a, a, an enemy combatant and you're just like and they recognize that you're just like a journalist walking around in plain clothes or whatever, like they're not just going to pick up a gun and shoot you in the head or at least they're not supposed to. This will come back later during the battle for Hill 881 on the 30th of April 1967. Leroy took a series of photos of U.S. Navy corpsman Vernon Wyke tending to a dying Marine, which were eventually published in Life magazine. This is uh, one of one of the most famous photos she took and also one of the ones that kind of started turning the tide of cultural opinion about the war. Um, it uh, it shows a, a young man probably in his late 20s uh dirty blonde hair uh kneeling and and like crouching over a marine who's been shot and looks like he's either dead or very close to death and the marine is like putting pressure on his chest to try and slow the bleeding and he's like kind of looking off into the distance with a frenzied like oh fuck they're coming and he's got a cigarette hanging out of his mouth yeah i mean this shit is cinematic like this this photo is just like it's it's unreal how real it is. I mean, number one, that that guy kind of looks like a young John Voight. <laughs> yeah, he does kind of. <laughs> and so this just this looks like it's just a screenshot from some war movie. Yeah, it really does. It looks like um, what's that Vietnam War movie that's all made with documentary footage? Uh, it's got a crazy name that's like Photo Op One One Nine Tenor or something like that. It's a 16 millimeter film that was shot as like a thesis film school. 
project. Um, and the whole movie's shot on 16 millimeter. Fuck, what was that? What's the name of that movie? I can't think of the name of the movie, but it, it looks like a scene from that from that film. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm even thinking like more than that. Like this this could just be a screenshot from some war movie that like Stan, Stanley Kubrick made in like the 1970s or something. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And and you know, like as as we as we were just talking about the first uh, televised war. Uh, and, you know, this is probably, you know, Catherine Leroy's war photography was probably some of the first real up close war photography that we've seen as a culture. You can really just imagine, uh, you know, Francis Ford Coppola and and um, and Stanley Kubrick, like studying these photos and actively trying to emulate them for their for their cinematography. Yeah, I mean, definitely it for better or for worse, like these are the <laughs> it's so dark to put put it this way. But like these uh, horrific moments in history that were captured by these photojournalists is like the groundwork for which all of these Oscar award winning movies would eventually be produced, which is like so bleak that like, oh, yeah, we're going to take all of these really insane stories about the human spirit and uh, the the horrific things that we do to each other and then just commodify it into like movies for us all to watch and enjoy. Oh, 84C Mopic. That is the name of the movie I was trying to think of. Uh, if you haven't seen 84C Mopic, it's very cool. It's like a fake documentary, basically, um, where the protagonist of the movie is uh, a is a GI that's part of the motion picture component uh, that's sent over there to document everything. So they don't they never refer to him by his name. They just always call him 84C Mopic because that's like his call sign is like official rank or whatever. I don't know. It's been a couple of years since I've seen the movie. But the whole movie is like a found footage film where you're watching this footage that he shot in World War Two going on like a helicopter mission with a bunch of other GIs. Uh, so it's got this really interesting dynamic um, where, you know, the movie's made in 1989 and it's a f- pretty much a fully found footage movie. At least that's my memory of it. Again, it's been a while, but I, I really enjoyed it when I watched it, um, which goes to show you it's exactly what we're talking about, where I'm just like, yeah, fucking movies are cool. Check it out. <laughs> Yeah, it's really it's a, you know, as bleak as it is to be recommending Vietnam War movies after just saying how frustrating it is that Vietnam War movies are the way a lot of us interact with this historical text. Uh, I feel like that one's not one people talk about a lot. And that's almost like that's the that's the snake that eats its own tail, right? Where we don't have any connection or insight into uh, the humanity of these soldiers that are going into war and so you know we're more effectively as a nation you know you talk about you talk about the difference in reaction between the vietnam war and world war ii and you could argue that there you could argue successfully and correctly i think that there are other factors that cause this difference in um in perception of those wars that you know the World War II was much more justified in many ways and was a much more, uh, in the context of wars, like a much more worthy battle to fight. But aside from that, you know, just looking at the two, the, the, the difference between the two or, you know, the difference between the Vietnam War and even like World War II and the Korean War, where during World War II, the United States was basically once once we entered into the war, we were like a, a united front. Like there was no negative sentiment about our once we once we jumped into the war, people that people didn't want us to jump into the war. And we had a very isolationist attitude towards it. But once we jumped into the war and once that like uniting event of Pearl Harbor happened, like everybody there was no like negative sentiment towards towards what we were doing for better or worse, whether that's right or wrong versus the Vietnam War, where it was this massively polarizing event that uh, was famously the source of a lot of protests and was just this, you know, there was people were massively critical of this war. And like I said, you could you could say that it was just the shifting social tides that were happening during the 1960s versus the 1940s. You could say that the war was less justified. 
But I also think that probably the idea of like showing us pictures of people fucking dying probably had something to do with it as well, where people were like, oh, shit, like, I guess, like, I don't know why I didn't think this was happening because it makes perfect sense, but it's really fucked up to see all these people dying and suffering and, you know, you're just, you're forced to think about the people and what's happening to them in a way that you can just, like, human brains are just really good at, like, not doing, like, out of sight, out of mind is something that we're really good at. And then to take that, which was, I think, a, a good thing, a a demonstrably good thing to humanize what was going on and make us see it and then turn that into a commodity like okay we can synthesize that humanization and turn it into entertainment which then devalues the humanization to the point where now we think of these things as these like archi- archetypical um like the, the you know the the cinematic the cinematification of reality where now we think of these things cinematically so now our brains don't align with the reality of things where we filter everything through like a cinematic lens. In our minds, everything happens like it happens in a movie. So we're unprepared to deal with the harsh realities of how things actually happen. And it's, that's, that's really fascinating how that cycle has happened where something that was t- that was meant to humanize things has like in turn like went around and got gotten back to like the dehuman the dehumanizing of things through this through the very same act yeah it's it's really bleak like it's really bleak uh and it's also something that it, at this point it's just part of the human condition like we're we're never going to not live in a world where our exit where our existence is filtered through the lens of a camera and now because of social media and everyone having a camera on their phone it's that cycle is like repeated almost on a second by second basis as opposed to like people used to picture themselves like as the protagonist of a movie right and now it's like no you are the protagonist of a movie that you are making about your own life in 15 second intervals all of the fucking time yeah and and like i said that very act, which started from this point of just like, let's bring cameras onto the battlefield to humanize these these people, has gone through the Pac-Man screen, come back out the other end to once again, basically dehumanize everybody in a way where it's like it figured out how to dehumanize people even while we're up close seeing them. And this is like, this is a, this is a perfect opportunity to talk about something which I don't, I didn't think there would, like, We've talked about this off podcast, and I didn't really th- know where this would ever fit in in an episode, but I've always wanted to talk about this, and I think it's perfectly relevant to this. Uh, we've talked about this before, but this idea that I think that there should be some kind of philosophical term that needs to be coined, which I have not thought of, and maybe it already exists, but I've never heard of it, and I just think it needs to exist, but a philosophical term for this idea where um we f- we basically like forget the the presence of the camera and the camera person when we're watching videos now because of the fact that we view everything through a screen and everything is filmed and everything is presented through a video format and because of the way that social media has slowly like created more intimate situations and simulated the i simulated the concept of friendships and personal uh private conversations with people that we then now like have when we when we watch something our minds don't process the fact that there is a camera there and that there's a there is a person holding the camera and there is an act being done on purpose for the benefit of a camera and that act is being done for the purpose of putting it onto social media to get views. Um, and an example that I've talked about with you is uh, a couple of things. One of them is there's these very popular types of videos on that I've seen on TikTok a lot where people will go around and they'll find homeless people and they'll basically like take them out for like a day of like buying them stuff like they'll go and they'll buy them all kinds of food 
and they'll like get them some clothes and they'll take them to like a barber and have them like give them a haircut and shave their face and like clean them up, take them to a spa. And it's this whole thing where they've like they they treat this homeless person for the day and then they're just like, yeah, you know, I just want I really wanted to help you, man. And it ends with them kind of like shaking hands and sometimes the guy will start crying and like give them a hug or whatever. And there's a lot of these videos on TikTok. And, you know, if you look in the comment sections of these videos, it's like all these people who are just like, oh, you're you're such a hero. Like, this is so great. You're the, you're a, such you're such a kind heart. Like you're you're the best. Uh, you know, and these people are like they have TikTok channels where they just do this. And so they they have followers that are just like know him, know this person as like the guy who goes around like helping homeless people or whatever. And because of whatever this philosophical concept is that I don't think has a term yet, people just don't understand or don't think about the fact that all of these things that they're watching, they're not there seeing them happen in real time or they're not like a fly on the wall seeing a private thing happening somewhere. They're watching a video that was intentionally shot and produced by a person for the express purpose of putting it onto social media to get views. And so they're not aware of how exploitative and weird and creepy this is. The idea that somebody would go around and be like, hey man, I'll get you, I'll buy you clothes and food, but in exchange, you have to like come on camera and like perform for me and like hug me and talk about how, what a great guy I am. And then the person's like, yeah, man, okay, I'll, I guess if you're going to buy me some stuff, then sure. Yeah, it's this weird unspoken contract of like unhoused minstrelsy empathy porn where it's like, okay, check it out. I'm never going to tell you that you are going to have your specific situation broadcast to potentially millions of people and they're all going to kind of ooh and ah and marvel and feel good about themselves because they're not in your situation, but also pity you, but also think, oh, what a wonderful person this usually faceless uh, influencer is that's going around and and gifting people, you know, oh, I'm going to buy you an apartment with a year's full of rent here, you know, or like another one that's really popular trope is like people going to drive through lines whether it be Starbucks or McDonald's or whatever, and ask asking the clerk at the drive through line, like, what is your dream? What is your dream? Oh, well, I want to be a novelist. Oh, well, I, I want to be an animator. Oh, I, I wanted to be a dancer, blah, 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 blah. Oh, okay, okay. And then coming back an hour later and like, this is so-and-so, the showrunner of blah, 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 blah. And I got you a role in the new episode of Glee, the next generation. Oh, this is all I've ever wanted. You know, like. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's yeah, it's the Nasubi thing. Where it's like live in this house and go through this abject torture. We're not making you, but if you do it, you'll be famous. So, you know. You're, you're, you're going to do it, right? You're going to do it. Yeah. Do you want a, a double-double from In-N-Out? Man who hasn't had a full meal in six days? Then let me low-key exploit your situation for likes on the internet. Yeah. And another 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 video that I saw, which isn't – this isn't like a trend or like a thing where there's multiple vi- – it was just a random one-off thing I saw. But And sometimes you see weird little random one-off things like this on TikTok where somebody happens to capture some strange thing and because it's – interesting it'll go viral on tiktok but it was a dude who was like with his camera was following around this little boy who was like three years old he seemed like he was about three and he looked a little he was like missing a shoe like he just had one shoe on and his other foot was was bare and he was a little three-year-old boy and you know three-year-olds i have a three-year-old and they're at a stage where they can carry on a conversation but they can't really ha- coherently communicate with you in a procedural way where they can communicate important information to you. They can kind of talk to you about random stuff, but if you ask them like where their parents are, they wouldn't be able to tell you. And so it's a little kid, three years old, at a, this park in some city, and he's following him around, and the little kid is like lost. Like he's just wandering around by himself. And this guy is like asking him where his mom is, asking him where his dad is, asking him, 
how he got there and and the and the kids just kind of like going off and rambling about random stuff and he's like trying to ask him like where is your parents where is this where where do you where do you live and all these things and he's trying to like help him get back to his house or get back to his parents or whatever trying to figure out what's going on why this little kid is wandering around by himself um and this video goes on for like 2 minutes of this and then finally, he ends up finding the parents. They're at the park. They're set up doing a barbecue, and the little kid just wandered off. And the kids see uh, the parents seem a little like nonplussed. They're like, "Oh, where'd you go?" And they it, like, and the whole kind of vibe of the point of the video is like these fucking negligent parents. Like they're just they're just hanging out, and they're just little three year old wandered off, and like they didn't even care. And they didn't even seem to notice he was gone or whatever. And this, and then you look at the comments. Once again, it's all these people being like, "You're a hero. This is the best." These horrible parents. If it wasn't for you, this kid could have gotten kidnapped and killed. And like conceptually, those things are correct. Technically, this person, if if this video is believed and not to be, if this if this video isn't fake, this person technically did help this kid. These parents technically did kind of seem weird and like, why the fuck are you, why are you just letting your kid wander off like this? This is kind of fucked up. And this this guy technically did help this kid when anybody else could have kidnapped him and it could have been bad. But there, like the, the whatever this concept is, the, it's like you watch the video and the part of your brain that recognizes that you're watching a video and contextualizes that it was uploaded to TikTok to get views turns off and you think that you're having like a direct intimate experience with somebody and you're not thinking about all of the context surrounding the idea that this person filmed a three-year-old little kid for like for like an hour and edited it down into a three-minute TikTok video to post on the internet to get vi- to get likes and views and like you just you're just not aware of that when you're watching it. You think that you're you think you're living something or 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 you're like experiencing it in real life. I mean that video specifically like it was a big black dude who was recording and if I was that guy, I would have started recording too just cuz I white people are weird. I don't want anybody to say I did something to this kid. I'm immediate as soon as that kid comes over for posterity, sure. I 100% what you're saying. Like you almost want to like start recording yourself whenever you're interacting with strangers a- at all anymore. Of uh, just like I'm gonna make sure that you don't fucking say I did something I didn't do, um, which is sad I think. But but th- but then to take it and make it into a TikTok video is just like and people are just are not aware. It's like sure fine he helped this kid, but it's really weird and creepy and exploitative that he posted this on the internet. Like I'm not I'm not trying to say I'm some kind of hero, but like a like a year or a couple years ago or whatever, I, I the exact same thing happened to me. I saw a little kid, he was younger, he was like two. He was just wandering around by himself. I had no idea where his parents were. And he was even less capable of communicating than this kid. And so I just kind of stood there. It was and and to your point of like making sure nobody thinks that it's sketchy, I had Spay J the Fourth with me. <laughs> you had Spay J the Fourth with you, Spay J. So I had a you know I had a stroller with a baby myself. So it's like I stood there for like an hour with this kid because I just literally I didn't know what to do. I was like I feel weird about I don't like calling the cops on for any situation. So I like that's that's not really an option to me to call the cops. So I just kind of stood there, and then finally these people walked up and got him, and I thought it was weird and kind of negligent. And fucked up. But you know what I didn't do? I didn't make a video out of it and post it on the internet. I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. I mean, there's a, there's a weird, there's a weird split in my mind right now because part of me is like, yeah, I, I don't think I would post that online either. And yet it's kind of hard to argue with somebody posting a video that gets X number of million views like that. The video that we were talking about with the little kid, like that thing was all over TikTok and had millions of views. And it's this weird thing of like, where does the moral culpability or like social 
culpability start and stop? And when does the craven clout chasing, obviously just trying to scrape by and get any sort of platform for yourself start and stop? I I don't know. I agree. It's weird. But also I I think people doing ASMR videos are fucking weird. And there's like like Patreons that make a million dollars where somebody is just like, clicking their teeth you know like <laughs> doesn't do anything for me but all right this is okay whatever yeah but that's 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 weird and i could argue that in general it's not necessarily healthy for us to be addicted to wanting to get views on the internet regardless of how innocent the content we're making is just the idea oh yeah i'm not saying it's okay i'm not saying it's a hundred percent i'm not i'm not saying that it's a good thing that we all are trained this way but it's the reality situation you know but ultimately I feel I find it very fascinating that or fascinating is maybe a very soft way of putting it, but that you can kind of trace it back to this idea of like these vernacular photos getting in with these people on the front lines, humanizing them, showing them directly up close, doing these things to the point where we've gone through this evolution to what you were saying before, which is that everybody is documenting their lives at all times even if it's not as interesting as being on the front lines in the Vietnam War. And now it's almost served as a way of dehumanizing us, where if everything is content, then nobody's lives is consequential. Which is actually a interesting transition into the next period of what we're going to talk about with Catherine Leroy's career, because, you know, she initially went over there to take photos of the U.S. GIs. And then a remarkable situation happened to her that really provided an, an insight into the Viet Cong in a way that I don't think had happened previously here in the West. On May 19th, 1967, while photographing Operation Hickory with a Marine unit near the Vietnamese demilitarized zone, Catherine Roy was severely injured by People's Army of Vietnam GAVN mortar fire. She was saved by her camera stopping a piece of shrapnel that would have killed her. While recovering, she flew to New York and signed with a high-profile photography agency, then immediately flew back to Vietnam to continue her coverage there. During the Tet Offensive, she and fellow journalist Francois Mazur were captured by PAVN troops and held captive. While there, she was able to talk the soldiers into letting her photograph the happenings. She was the first journalist to take pictures behind enemy lines during the Vietnam War. Can you imagine that? Can you can you can you just like can you imagine how terrifying it would be to be taken as a prisoner of war? And then the insane level of gumption it would take to be like, look, 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 look. I know I'm dressed like I'm part of the U.S. military, but I'm really not. Like, look at my accent. I'm French. I'm French. I'm not I'm not here for that. Just let me take some photos. Just let me get a selfie, bro. Just let me get a I know you're trying to put me in this like literal cage, but just let me, uh, just let me just take some photos, bro. Come on. Yeah. I mean, first of all, the fact that shrapnel was stopped by her camera, that's like some that's like some fucking movie shit. Like that's that's something that's something you can't you, you you could only write that like oh this photographer and her life was saved by her camera it, like th- that's that's unreal I can't believe that that is I can't believe that happened um but also yeah I mean I get captured by a hostile uh, army that's like holding me as a POW like I'm I'm fucking sitting there weeping all day, every day it cowering in a, in the fetal position. Like, just like, I'm going to fucking die. I'm going to fucking die. This is the end of my life. She's like, listen, I'm, I got a lot of downtime now. Now, do you want me sitting here taking up space in your cage, you know, crowding the other prisoners? People, people tend to not like French people very much. They think that they're a little smelly. They think that their accents are a little, you know, the, People from outside of the France, like there's a there's a stereotype about not liking French people. They think they're rude. So I, you know, I won't be in there bugging your people, causing a causing a, a ruckus, you know, agitating people. Just let me, just let me take a little take take a few pictures. So me a little snappy snappy here, a little snappy snappy there. I mean, my, I got to do something. I got to you know. L- let me put it this way: Do you want my mind thinking about? modes of escape or do you want to engaged in uh beautiful photography compositions she just starts whistling the theme the theme to the great escape and they just let her out they're like oh all right yeah take some photos whatever 
Yeah, it's fucking crazy. So we're looking here at the uh, the cover to Life magazine. Uh, this issue is called A Remarkable Day in Hue. The Enemy Lets Me Take His Picture by Catherine Leroy. Um, and uh, it's the cover is two North Vietnamese soldiers sitting in a, like almost like a little dugout thing. Um, they're wearing uniforms with makeshift insignias on them. And, uh, one of them is holding a Chinese manufactured AK-47. Yeah. So, and it's interesting too, cause they both look, um, they both have an expression on their faces where they're, they're like slightly filled with concern and they're like processing. Like they're both obviously looking at her as she's taking the photo and kind of like realizing what's happening. Yeah, coupled coupled with the with the headline, it's kind of funny because like the enemy lets me take his picture, and then their reactions are like, "The fuck you doing back there?" Yeah, yeah, they're both facing the opposite direction, turning around to look over their shoulders and see her, and um, it's a very evocative image. You know, it's obviously a shot on films, so with the the colors are very lush and very um uh, saturated, and you know, these two men's faces are very filled with character and. And uh, they're interesting looking people. And uh, well, you know, what's really fascinating is and maybe this is I, I don't know how intentional this was, but it's almost if it was intentional, it's genius. But with coupled with the headline, the enemy lets me take his picture. The that headline, you see the image. So you immediately associate their their faces and what they're looking at and their facial expressions with that headline to the point where. In this photo, in this photograph, the the photographer is in the photograph. The photographer is a character in this, and and arguably the main character of this photo, because that's that's immediately what you're thinking about. You're thinking about the person on the other side of the camera holding the camera. What's going to happen? Why are they looking at her like that? They seem angry. Is she in danger? This headline coupled with this photo makes the photographer the main character of the photo. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And then the, the next photo we have here is a photo from the, the article itself, um, which is a young Vietnamese soldier uh, with a rifle standing in uh, a trench looking out through some firing lines that have been uh, kind of they're in some sort of concrete structure. Um, and he's like looking out, surveying the the field of battle ahead of them. Um and he's uh, he's wearing, you know, kind of like an olive fatigue and he's got uh, pouches, a belt with a lot of pouches around his waist. So we both know that I like that. I love pouches. Big fan of drawing pouches. And uh, it's a it's a very lonely photo. It's it looks like he's kind of like apprehensive and kind of like what's coming down the pike next. Kathleen Roy's photos are widely credited as broadening the discourse for the war and humanizing both sides of the conflict. In early 1968, she was awarded the George Polk Award by the Overseas Press Club for her photos on Hill 881, becoming the first freelancer and first woman to win the award. At the award ceremony in early April in New York, she used her acceptance speech to berate the Associated Press for which she accused of losing her negatives, which spoiled her relationship with the Associated Press and with Horst Foss. Returning to South Vietnam in May, she struggled to regain her momentum, losing her drive for field work. When you look at war photographs, it's a silent moment of eternity. But for me, it's haunted by sound, a deafening sound. In Vietnam, most of the time it was extremely boring, exhausting and boring. You walked for miles through rice paddies or jungle, walking, crawling in the most unbearable circumstances, and nothing was happening. And then suddenly, all hell would break loose. That's from an interview that she did in the Los Angeles Times on December 8th, 2002, for an article called A Window on the War. Her last major Vietnam photo essay, This Is That War, was published in Look magazine on the 14th of May, 1968, in the same issue where the editors changed their policy to denounce the war. That's a that's a total Windsor McKay move. Just be like standing on stage, accepting this big achievement award, and instead of saying anything else, just being like, those motherfuckers at the AP lost my shit! <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Act two, truly a life. Attempting to leave behind her life of anguish and killing documentation, Leroy took an assignment covering Woodstock. However, when she arrived, she realized that she had lost the passion for photography and instead linked up with soldiers that she had met during her time abroad and spent the next few months touring with various musicians and doing drugs with her military buddies. In 1972, she and Frank Cavastani began filming Operation Last Patrol, a film about Ron Kovic and the anti-war Vietnam veterans in protest at the 1972 Republican Convention. Shot in the demilitarized zone January 20th, 1968. I was moving my squad across an open area into a village. I took a 30 caliber bullet uh, through my right foot, got a hole in it. And uh, I took another 30 caliber through my right shoulder and went through my lung and it severed my spinal cord, paralyzing me permanently from here down. But I can't move or feel anything from here down. It's numb and it's as dead as anybody who's died in the war in Vietnam. I spent uh, about a week in the intensive care ward in Da Nang. I saw people totally destroyed by this war. I saw babies who had been napalmed by American planes. I heard them scream every night. Nobody can protect the communist country. Nobody can do demonstration. Nobody. When you do demonstration, you never go for America. You never go to jail. You want everyone. If they win, if they win, the they have one, man. They won gonna, 20 years ago. You're going to be the first one against the wall because they know that if you're a traitor to your own country, they sure as hell can't trust you. You're the traitors. Nobody <laughs> likes war. The best way to get it over is to win it. How would you like so your own win it and get the hell out Who of here? Who are you going to defeat? Hopefully guys like you. <laughs> This is like a really disturbing protest just to give context where these people are wearing these like really creepy masks that are they're dressed, I, I don't even, they're, dress, they're just dressed like really disturbing caricatures of like the Statue of Liberty and Lady Justice with these really creepy masks on and it was really, the screaming that was coming from really disturbing. That man inside there is a criminal. I come to you with the truth tonight, based on my experiences in Vietnam. I do not come to deceive you. I come only to let you know the facts. And I ask you to join me in my protest. Come over this line and sit with me. Can I break through your solid wall of complacency tonight? Can I have an inch? Can I have a moment of your compassion for the human beings that are sent? The film inspired Kovic to go on to write his autobiography, Born on the Fourth of July, which would later be made into a feature film. It would also go on to win Oscars and star Tom Cruise as Kovic. Leroy would return to Saigon to witness the fall of Saigon in 1975. She would later cover conflicts in Northern Ireland, Cyprus, Somalia, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Iran. She retired from war photography in the early 1990s. That is so much trauma. I can't even comprehend doing that. After she retired, she lived in the Hotel Chelsea throughout the 1980s and eventually went on to open a vintage clothing store, Peace Unique. In 2005, Paris Match sent her to Arizona for a reunion with Vernon Wick in what would ultimately become her final photo assignment. She passed away in Santa Monica in California one week after being told that she had lung cancer. Lung cancer from just inhaling all of that badassery for fucking... 50 years dude for real talk about dude t for real talk about somebody who just fucking like floored it and i know that cycle like I, kn I know that's like a trope with war correspondence where they get addicted to the the adrenaline and the excitement and the you know the peaks and valleys of doing uh conflict oriented journalism um but man it's it's wild to see in just one person's like career how the way that we tell ourselves the story of what's happening to us has changed, you know, like every one of those wars, Somalia, Iraq, Iran, Vietnam, were such very different patinas of human trauma. Like they're so vastly different. And the fact that she was there covering all of it, it's just like kind of mind blowing to me that you, that you would keep 
that you would remain impassioned and feel that responsibility even after enduring all the things that she endured. It's 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 very impressive. Yeah, just the, like the idea that we were talking about earlier of this of just you know sacrificing yourself for this very specific cause, which is like like I said, like the 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 insight and the prescience to realize that this one little cog in this wheel of like taking pictures at these locations. It's not like she was masterminding some grand strategy for how to uh, turn the tides of sentiment towards the Vietnam War in the West. It was just like this one specific thing. She's like, I need to just go to these places and take pictures and give those pictures and get them published. And I just needed to keep doing this over and over again. The the prescience of knowing that that was going to have a large macro effect on culture and the ability to just commit to it despite the massive amounts of danger that was, she was constantly being put in. And the fact that like, not only was she being put into danger, but she also did literally get captured and held as a POW for a certain amount of time and then just went out and went back to it again is just mind blowing. Yeah. And repeatedly went back to it. It wasn't just like one time, but spent 30 years going back to it. Yeah. And I think, and maybe there is some aspect of the addiction to the adrenaline of it at some point. Cause like we were talking about, she went to photograph Woodstock and then she got bored by it. And then she just started hanging out with like former GIs and shit, which like, by the way, I, I had no idea that she was just directly involved in essentially the, the creation of the born on the 4th of July book and movie. Like she, shot that little documentary with the, with him and he eventually like I I didn't I didn't I didn't had no idea about that but that she she maybe there's some element of the addiction to the dr- adrenaline rush or whatever at some point but like I don't think that was the case in the beginning like she didn't have the frame of reference and whether or not that addiction would like carry you on for 30 years like that I don't I don't know about that either I it, I'm may, I'm sure there's some element of it but also it just seemed like she just decided like I am this one specific piece in this puzzle and I just have to keep doing this until I die. Yeah. And I think there's a there's kind of um you know I think there's something that's uh that's to be said about like once you find a calling that's greater than yourself, it's really hard to find solace or meaning in any anything selfish, you know? Cuz you've experienced what it's like when you're able to connect and and be of service, which I think um, is the ultimate kind of human endeavor, right? You you want to be useful. You want to feel valued. You want to give more than you receive. Um, and putting her life on the line in the way that she did, it's amazing. <laughs> she died of cancer as an older person, as opposed to getting shrapnel to the chest. Yeah, I mean, she kind of won in that regard, right? Like, it sucks, like cancer sucks fuck cancer it's not a good way to die at least it seems like she kind of went fast um from the time that she was diagnosed uh as opposed to these long drawn out situations that are very devastating um but in this very specific context of like you spent your entire life and career like literally on the front lines in combat scenarios and you died of like a complex medical situation like you, that you kind of won. Yeah. Yeah. And also, you you know, you had a direct hand in shifting public opinion. Right. Like, I think that's I think that's the goal of every artist is to impact their surroundings, to to create work that makes a ripple effect, whether it be large or small. And she empirically did that. <laughs> like, she really, really did that. Um, and it also kind of just makes me think about the flip side of that of just how how easy it is or not easy but how in, how important that how important it is to create a world where people who are reporting on these traumatic and extreme environments are taken seriously and viewed with the proper amount of respect and how the m- larger media companies that own the apparatuses that these people work within, that the context laundering that you have talked about previously strips the most vital component of a lot of that, where, you know, a camera is a machine that manufactures empathy and every other machine of enterprise that we currently have in modern society strips empathy from it um which is just so fucking bleak yeah 
because because this doesn't even really exist anymore, right? Like to this to this degree, like the the I mean, we still send journalists overseas to document conflict to a certain degree. It's more predominantly done by by the uh, the, the British press. Like that's where the majority of like conflict documentation happens now. And it still it still happens here, but I mean if you if you've ever read like Manufacturing Consent, the the Noam Chomsky book, it's it's like essentially about how from this time in the nineteen sixties, the consolidation of power by corporate interest in the media has all but eliminated this kind of coverage. Like this is not the types of things that news organizations do anymore. They they either report on just like you know, completely, uh, you know, relatively inconsequential stuff, or when they do cover important topics, it's very controlled and made sure that it's leaning towards a positive spin on the thing that just like makes whatever governments look good that need to look good and make whatever businesses look good that need to look good. And, you know, Catherine Leroy wouldn't be allowed to sort of navigate the current like media landscape in, in the in the United States or maybe even just the West in general. I don't know. Yeah. And even if she did, the mechanisms that distribute this content just aren't the same. You know, having a magazine editor fight for your story and then it going out is just a fundamentally different thing than what happens now, where even if the actual article on the New York Times times or whatever is the same it has to get boiled down into a tweet and you're only going to get you know a square cropped photo on instagram and then that's going to get photoshopped by somebody and then it's going to be used on both sides of the political aisle for completely divergent and antithetical viewpoints and like everybody's constantly lobbying and and um obviously the 60s was a very polarizing diametrically opposed politically tumul- politically tumultuous time as well i'm just saying the mechanisms now are so different they're almost non comparable yeah and it's that it's all of that and also just the massive amount of content right cuz like you know we had we had those photos of those that little boy who was just like involved in a in a in a bombing in uh syria and he's just like covered in in like soot and just his hair is all matted up and he just looks like he's just sitting there this cute little boy just sitting there in that in like a seat on an ambulance or whatever like it's a, a devastating photo and it's like his parents are dead you, I, what you know you don't know it's a devastating photo but like what what did that do what did it do it didn't it, it did that scratch any surface of anything like i think we just kind of like saw it people were horrified for like two seconds and then just kind of moved on. Cause it's like ev- everything you're talking about. Plus there's just more content than we could ever fucking absorb in a day. Yeah. I think a, th- a lot of, I think something a lot of people experience on a day to day basis on a subconscious level is that for better or for worse. Now we get to choose how we feel where that wasn't necessarily the case in previous generations. You didn't get to choose what, you know, information entered your sphere. And I don't mean that in terms of like, oh, I'm only going to read fucking New York Times or I'm only going to watch fucking Young Turks or I'm only going to go and watch Fox News or whatever. It's more like I'm sad right now because some piece of information has entered my sphere. I'm going to go watch cute, cuddly cats sitting on capybara videos for two hours, you know? Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I'm I'm horny right now. There's an infinite well of pornography at a fingertip away. I'm scared right now. I want to be comforted. I'm going to go watch Paddington 2 on a loop. You know, like there's it's you we we actively curate our experiences now in ways that previous generations didn't have to struggle with. Yeah, it's the it's the mood organ from do Andrew do Android's dream of electric sheep. Just like you wake up in the morning and you just press some buttons and dial in the chemistry of your of your mood for the day. Yeah, 100 percent, 100 percent. Um, and, uh, that has its own existential, you know, emotions on demand is its own existential abyss that I don't think anybody currently is grappling with. Um, I think we're all just battered by the day and trying to survive, but I think that that is something that further down the line will, you know, I don't don't know that having everything immediately in arm's reach all the time, always, you know, maybe, maybe I shouldn't be able to, you know, 
fucking grub hub an entire chocolate cake to my house at 2 a.m. You know, like maybe I shouldn't. As you that. did last night. <laughs> of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I'm wiping the chocolate cake off my face right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, 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 in this time, whenever Catherine Leroy did this. It was in a situation where there's a there's a bit of a an information vacuum, and if you can bring any information into that vacuum, you can change culture, you can change society, you can change hearts and minds with a single photograph. Because this isn't a this isn't a deficit of information about this thing, other than just kind of what people are talking about, what keep people are kind of speculating at home. So you show somebody a picture. And it's it's that def it's that definition of a picture is worth a thousand words because it's like this photograph can just shift public opinion about something in an instant. Whereas now we have we have too much of this. We have we have all the horrible information in the world at our fingertips. We can we can access all the horrible stuff whenever we want. And we also have the power to not. We 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 don't have to be confronted with it. Because like you said, there's there's always, you know, the office uh, on Peacock. Just skip the first season. That one's a little rough. Start at the second season and you're good. I'm Dave Baker. And I'm Spandrew Spice. This has been Deep Cuts. You can find me online at heydavebaker.com where you can purchase comics like Forest Hills Bootleg Society, Halloween Boy, Star Trek, and other stuff that I have done. But frankly, might want to do that soon because I'm fucking leaving the country soon. Spandrew Pice. Spice. Spandrew Spice. Where can people find you on the internet? Spandrew Pice. What a fucking stupid name. That sounds dumb. You can find me uh, crawling through the trenches with my iPhone 14 Pro Max getting beautiful, crisp photographs in gorgeous 4K HDR of the, 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 the space hell battle of... Four billion SB. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm going to space hell, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring back the fo- the photographs that are gonna finally humanize the space hell demons for everybody. And you can also not find me on social media because I don't use social media. But you can join us on. You can follow uh, if you, uh, if you, uh, the Deadbolt book on Andrew's website, dapricewrites.com. You can follow us on social media. Follow us on Facebook, Deep Cuts Podcast. Join our Facebook group, the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group. Or we talk about the show and make memes. You can join our Discord server, bitly.com slash deep or fuck. Bitly.com slash deep cuts discord. I'm fucking up on this. I was getting I had this down to like a routine and now I, I can't do it. Or we talk about the show and make memes and talk about other stuff and play games and all kinds of stuff. You can join uh, follow us on Instagram at Deep Cuts Pod. You can follow us on TikTok at Mystery Treehouse. You can go to our website, deepcutspod.com, click on the shop and buy T-shirts and hats and other things. You can get our Mystery Treehouse Junior Sleuth shoulder patch, and you can buy our exclusive prints of the Space Hell Battle uh, uh, War. Deep Cuts is a production by Boy Genius Media. If you'd like to find this show and others like it, please visit boygeniusmedia.com or deepcutspod.com. If you want to join in on post-episode discussions, please join the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group. Finally, subscribe to our YouTube channel for additional video content.